So Peter Schiff of Europac.com, billions under management, for folks that don't know who you are, obviously we usually get you on about financial stuff. We'll spend some time on that in the brief time we have, but I've set the table here about the state of the world, the open borders, this idea we've got to pay for all these people who mainly invaded Syria to take it over and failed. What is Obama, Hollande, Merkel thinking? That they're going to start attacking us. They are attacking us. What do they think they're going to do? I mean, they're going to get held responsible, or maybe they're not. Look, I have no idea what they think about these things, and I don't know uh, how much they actually care about it. I think uh, you know Obama's just trying to finish out his term without any major disasters happening. That's probably uh, the most important thing for him. And then if something happens uh, after he's gone, well, it's, it's somebody else's fault. Uh, but, you know, the, the real problems that I'm that I'm paying attention to are what's happening in, in the economy, because those are man-made disasters. Those are disasters that we're really bringing about uh, on our own. And we, we have a lot of control there. And I'm more concerned about the damage being done to, to our economy from within than what I'm concerned about the threats from from without. And that's unfortunate because the federal government is there to protect us. Uh, from our, our international enemies, but instead we need protection from our domestic enemy, which is the federal government. Well, I agree, but the very same thinking that's bankrupting our future, Peter, your audio just cut off for a moment. That very same thinking <clears throat> is the thinking that brings in people from radical jihad areas and won't even screen their passports. I mean, this is insanity. <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, the problem is the government spends so much resources, so much time doing all the things that they shouldn't do, that there's not, a, there's not much left over to actually do the things they're, they're supposed to do. The government is there to preserve and protect our liberties. And unfortunately, our liberties are at threat from the government, right? They talk about having uh, the fox guard, guard your head house. That's what's going on right now when the government is there to protect us. So what is the big uh, economic news? There's a lot of it. Yeah, look, a lot of stuff is happening. You know, today... Uh, we got the non-farm payroll number, which, you know, that's all anyone talks about. They don't talk about the trade deficit that came out today, too, which was much worse than expected. In fact, our exports were at the lowest they've been in three years. And in fact, our trade deficit with Mexico just hit a three-year high. Uh, they revised up last month's trade deficit and made it worse than they originally reported. So all of this is going to weigh on GDP. In fact, earlier in the week, we got the ISM manufacturing number. It came out way below estimates, 48.6, the biggest drop in more than six years. This, the last time the ISM was this low was during the 2008-2009 Great Recession. Uh, the only time it almost got this low was back in 2012, just before the Fed launched QE3. So manufacturing is already in a recession. We got the ISM non-manufacturing numbers yesterday, which came out way below expectations as well. Not in contraction mode yet, but give it time. I think this is coming. So manufacturing is in recession. The overall economy will likely join the manufacturing sector next year. In fact, in the jobs numbers that came out today, we lost manufacturing jobs again. All we did is create a bunch of service sector jobs, low paying jobs. In fact, the vast majority of these jobs are probably part time jobs. We had a big spike this month in involuntary part-time employment, people accepting reluctantly part-time jobs, even though they want full-time jobs. Yet everyone is still convinced the Fed is about to raise interest rates uh, in, what, a week and a half? And, you know, they just might do it now because Janet Yellen has basically assured everybody that it doesn't matter if they raise rates now. What matters is what do they do afterwards? And that she's basically trying to take the sting out of it by making this the most dovish rate hike ever, by saying, look, even if we raise rates, we're not going to raise them very much in the future, and it's going to be a long time before we raise them again. So don't worry, we're going to go very slowly. In fact, I think they're going to go so slow that it's going to be one and done. I think when they raise rates, the next thing they're going to do is cut them back down to zero because we'll probably be in a recession next year or close enough to it that the Fed tries to delay the onset of that recession by stimulating again, by going back down to zero doing QE4, and of course, when the Fed does that, they're going to look like complete fools. Well, they talked about it. the jobs report was good, raising it a little bit, but now Yellen's playing that down. You know, well, she's been doing that uh, for months now. Ever since the stock market was tanking in September when they were afraid of the rate hike, Janet Yellen's been doing everything she can to backtrack, but the only reason she might raise rates, despite the fact that the data that she claims to be depending on 
is awful is because she feels that her credibility will be lost if she doesn't. She only wants to raise rates to prove that we can do it. It's to try to send some kind of message of confidence that the Fed is confident enough in the economy to raise rates, even though they're not confident at all. Because if they were confident, they would have raised rates years ago and they wouldn't be promising to move so slowly. Meanwhile, you know, the data is bad and they don't want to acknowledge that if the Fed was data dependent, they wouldn't be raising rates based on their own criteria, but they don't want to acknowledge what should be obvious. But now even, you know, even Citigroup now is coming out and saying that they put the odds of a recession next year at 65 percent. What does the move to bring the Chinese currency into the world bastic of currency signify? Well, I think for Americans, it signifies uh, the end of an era. I think it's the beginning of a larger move that will elevate the value of the yuan uh, relative to the dollar. And I think anything that threatens the dollar's dominance as a reserve currency is a threat to our phony standard of living. I mentioned earlier that we had a larger than expected trade deficit. Our trade deficits are enormous. And what we do is we give the world the paper that we print for the goods that they produce. And it's not an even swap. We get things of real value and they just get little pieces of paper. But as the world wakes up to reality, they're not gonna want our paper anymore. They're gonna realize that it's not worth the paper it's printed on. And then it's gonna be impossible for us to import the things that we need. It's also impossible to produce the things that we need because we don't have the productive capacity. We don't have the factories anymore. We don't have the workers that even know how to operate the machines assuming that, that we had them. Uh, so the economy is all screwed up and it's not prepared uh, for what's about to happen. But the, what's going on with the Chinese yuan is a step in that process. Going over the economic numbers, the ISM and others, does that just confirm what you thought was going to happen or does it change your prognosis in any way? No, it confirms it because this is all weak economic data showing the weakness underlying our economy that everybody wants to ignore. Meanwhile, you know, people were expecting much more money printing coming out of the ECB and Mario Draghi yesterday didn't deliver that. And we had a huge drop in the dollar against the euro. The dollar lost about 3% in one day. Gold has had a little bit of a muted reaction yesterday. Gold was up about 10 bucks yesterday, but now it's up more than $20 today. In fact, gold is now over $40 above its low yesterday morning. We're seeing big moves up now in gold stocks. And the last time I was on this program, what I, was, what I told you about gold, is that I believe that regardless of what the Fed does, whether they raise by 25 basis points or not, gold prices are going higher because it's already fully discounted into the market. In fact, I believe more rate hikes than are actually going to be delivered have been built into the market. Lots of people have shorted gold on anticipation of a rate hike, and I think they're buying the fact beforehand. They're not waiting for the Fed to hike rates to start buying. They're already buying and think by the time the Fed does hike rates, if they do in a week and a half, prices could be considerably higher for me here. In the meantime, I think the dollar could go down. And what nobody is paying attention to is while everybody's pretending that everything is great in the U.S., the economic data is actually stronger now in Europe than it is in the United States. That's how bad our data is. So our Federal Reserve is talking about tightening, even though our data is weaker than the European data, and they're talking about more stimulus. So I think what's going to surprise everybody next year is the fact that the Europeans have to slam on the brakes. We're the ones that are going to be stepping on the monetary gas. And so the dollar is going to be the weak currency, and gold is going to be the primary beneficiary of that. I want to take a call for you. Richard in California has a question about silver. Richard, go ahead. You're on the air with Peter Schiff of Pacific Pack. Go ahead. Euro Pacific Pack. Go hello ahead. There, Alex. Euro Pacific Capital. Peter. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, caller. Um, hello there, Alex and Peter Shiv. It's good to talk to you both. Um, it's, I have a few points, but the first one is on silver. Um, what What do you expect silver to do? I keep hearing the word that silver is supposed to be the new gold, but I wonder why and how and what way. Well, I don't know if it's the new gold, but it just needs to be the old silver. I mean, silver is still valuable. It doesn't have to replace gold. It's, it's simply, you know, gold's less expensive cousin. It has monetary properties. It's been used as money. And the two precious metals uh, kind of move in the same direction. May, maybe silver just has more volatility. So when the metals are going down and silver goes down more and when they're going up, 
it goes up more, but I expect uh, substantial appreciation in both gold and silver. But when it comes to the difference between the two or the ratio between gold and silver, I think there's actually more upside potential in gold, well, in silver rather, relative to gold, given the ratio now is very extreme uh, in, in, you know, in gold's favor against silver. So I would look in this bull market when this new bull market resumes, and if gold's 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, wherever it ends up, maybe higher than that, I think the appreciation sure. in silver on a percentage basis will be even higher. Let me ask this, which, which metal do you think is more undervalued? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think historically you would say silver if you just look at the ratio. Right? That's what I'd but, say. You know, there there could be there could be other things that are at play uh, that influence that. Uh, but historically, the ratio is pretty pretty solid. And what has less of a supply though? What has less of a in the ground supply? We know about, isn't it? Isn't it gold? Well, gold is going to be scarcer than silver. I mean, that's one of the reasons it's so much more sure, valuable. But I mean, per capita, though, there's less gold uh, they think in in new discoverable reserves in the metric from the articles I've read, then there is silver uh, still in what they're discovering. Gold's becoming even more scarce, or is that wrong? I, you know, I'm not, I'm not certain of, the, of, of, of those numbers. I know that gold in general is scarcer than silver, and it has, it has properties that silver doesn't have. It's a more valuable metal based on its, its properties. Um, and I think that when the world goes back to a gold standard, I don't think it's going to go back to a bimetallic standard, you know, officially. Uh, like we did in the United States, we had gold and silver. But I think when we remonetize gold, I don't know that the same thing is going to happen to silver. But silver is still going to be used, I believe, uh, by the people as money. And there's going to be a lot more demand for it. Well, I know this. There's so much paper out there. It's been going on forever. All these <laughs> credit default swaps. This has got to come down sometime. Richard, thank you so much. Uh, for your call. When we come back, I'm going to try to go to some other calls here. I'll do some overdrive, too, to finish with everybody's call. People that are patiently holding, like Dante, Jared, James, Sean, and others. But in the minute we've got before break, uh, Peter Schiff, what else is on your radar that you think people should know about? Well, I think the most important thing is this change in dynamic. And, you know, everybody was looking for the Fed to begin raising interest rates as, oh, the beginning of a tightening cycle. And I think if it's more of a one and done, if it's, hey, we're just raising rates now to prove that we can do it, but don't worry, we're not going to be raising them a lot anytime soon. I think that really changes the dynamic. And, you know, it was very interesting because Janet Yellen was asked a question yesterday. She was testifying before Capitol Hill and uh, somebody asked her, what if we are in recession next year? What are you going to do? What are your tools? And what Janet Yellen said was, well, you know, if it turns out that we raised interest rates, we'll just lower them. And then because, you know, quantitative easing works so well in the past, we'll just do it again, which shows you how clueless she is. Because if we are right back in recession next year, that proves that quantitative easing didn't work. Absolutely. Europac.com. <laughs> Europac.com. Uh, Euro Pacific Capital Inc., the head of that. Peter Schiff, our guest, will be back soon with us. We're going to come back with your phone calls. Stay with us.